The Gospel of Healing by A. B. Simpson Chapter 1 The Scriptural Foundation Man has a twofold nature. He is both a material and a spiritual being, and both natures have been equally affected by the fall. His body is exposed to disease. His soul is corrupted by sin. How blessed, therefore, to find that the complete scheme of redemption includes both natures and provides for the restoration of physical as well as the renovation of spiritual life. The Redeemer appears among men with his hand stretched out to our misery and need offering both salvation and healing. He offers himself to us as a savior to the utmost, his indwelling spirit, the life of our spirit, his resurrection body, the life of our mortal flesh. He begins his ministry by healing all that have need of healing. He closes it by making on the cross a full atonement for our sin. And then, on the other side of the open tomb, he passes into heaven, leaving the double commission for all the world and all the days, even unto the end of the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This was the faith once delivered unto the saints. What has become of it? Why, it is not still universally taught and realized. Did it disappear with the apostolic age? Was it withdrawn when Peter, Paul, and John were removed? By no means. It remained in the church for centuries and only disappeared gradually in the growing worldliness, corruption, formalness, and unbelief. With a reviving faith, with a deepening spiritual life, with a more marked and spiritual recognition, of the Holy Spirit and the living Christ, and with a nearer approach of the returning Master himself, this blessed gospel of physical redemption is beginning to be restored to its ancient place, and the Church is slowly learning to reclaim what she never should have lost. But along with this, there is also manifest such a spirit of conservative unbelief and cold, traditional, theological rationalism as to make it necessary that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. First of all, we must be sure of our scriptural foundations. Faith must ever rest on the divine word, and the most important element in the prayer of faith is a full and firm persuasion that the healing of disease by simple faith in God is a part of the gospel and doctrine of the scriptures. Number one, the earliest promise of healing is in Exodus chapter 15, verses 25 through 26. Quote, There he made for them a statue and an ordinance. And there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord thy God, which healeth thee. Unquote. The place of this promise is most marked. It is at the very outset of their journey, like Christ's healing of disease at the opening of his ministry. 
It comes immediately after the passage of the Red Sea. And we know that this event was distinctly typical of our redemption and that the journey of the Israelites in the wilderness is typically of our pilgrimage. These things happened unto them for ensamples, and are written for our admonitions, upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. This promise therefore becomes ours as the redeemed people of God, and God meets us at the very threshold of our pilgrimage with a covenant of healing, declaring that as we walk in holy and loving obediency, we shall be kept from sickness, which belongs to the old life of bondage we have left behind us forever. Sickness belongs to the Egyptians, not to the people of God. And only as we return spiritually to Egypt do we return to its malarias and perils. Nay, this is not only a promise, it is a statue and an ordinance. And so, corresponding to this ancient statue, the Lord Jesus has left for us in James chapter 5, verse 14, a distinct ordinance of healing in his name as sacred and binding as any of the ordinances of the gospel. Number 2, Psalms 105, verse 37. He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among the tribes. This shows us the actual fulfillment of that promise. Although they did not fulfill their part in the covenant, yet God kept his word. And so, although our faith and obedience are often defective, yet if Christ is our surety, and if our faith will claim his merits and his name, we too shall see the promise fulfilled. Number three, Job 1 and 2. The story of Job is one of the oldest records of history. He gives us a view of the source from which sickness came in this case, Satan, and the course of action which brings the healing, that is, taking the place of humble self-judgment at the mercy seat. If ever a sick chamber was unveiled, it was that of the man of Oz. But we see no physician there, no human remedy, but only a looking unto God as his avenger. And he, when he renounces his self-righteousness and self-vindication and takes the place where God is seeking to bring him, that of self-renunciation and humility, he is healed. Number four. Psalms 102, verse 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. The Psalms of David are a record of many afflictions, but God is always the deliverer and God alone. We see no human hand. The psalmist looks to heaven as directly for healing as he does for pardon. And in the same breath he cries, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases? And it is a complete healing, all his diseases, as universal and lasting as the forgiveness of his sins. And how glorious and entire that was, is evident enough as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. But here, as in the case of Job, there is an intimate connection between the sickness and the sin, and both must be healed together. Number five, Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12 and 13. And Asa in the thirtieth and nine year of his reign, was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers. Here was a king who had begun his reign by an act of simple, implicit trust in God, 
when human resources utterly failed him. And by that trust, chapter 14, verses 9 through 12, he won one of the most glorious victories of history. But success corrupted him and taught him to value too highly the arm of flesh, so that in his next great crisis, chapter 16, verse 7 and 8, he formed an alliance with Syria and lost the help of God. He refuses to take warning from the prophet and rushes on to the climax of his earthly confidency. He becomes sick. Here is a greater full, full than the Ethiopians. But again, he turns to man. He sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. And more sad or sadistic could not well be the vivid picture of the issue. And Asa slept with his fathers. Number six, Isaiah chapter 53, verse four and five. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And with his stripes we are healed. This is the great evangelical vision, the gospel of the Old Testament, the very mirror of the coming Redeemer. And here, in front of it, prefixed by a great amen, the only surely in the chapter is the promise of healing, the very strongest possible statement of complete redemption from pain and sickness by his life and death. And the very words of the evangelist afterwards quotes under the inspired guidance of the Holy Ghost, Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, as the explanation of his universal, universal works of healing. The translation of our English version does very imperfect justice to the force of the original. The translation in Matthew 8, 17 is much better, quote, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, unquote. The literal translation would be, quote, Surely he hath borne away our sicknesses and carried away our pains, unquote. Any person who will refer to such a familiar commentary as that of Albert Barnes on Isaiah or any other Hebrew authority will see the two words here used denote respectively sickness and pain, and that the words for bear and carry denote not mere sympathy, but actual substitution, and the removal utterly of the thing born. Therefore, as he has borne our sins, Jesus Christ has also borne away and carried off our sicknesses, yes, and even our pains, so that abiding in him we may be fully delivered from both sickness and pain. Thus, by his stripes, we are healed. Blessed and glorious gospel. Blessed and glorious burden bearer. Thus, the ancient prophet beholds in vision the Redeemer coming first as a great physician, and then hanging on the cross as a great sacrifice. And thus, the evangelists have also described him. For three years, the great healer, and then, for six hours of shame and agony, the dying lamb. Number seven. Matthew 8, verse 16 and 17. He healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Elias the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. This is quoted as the reason why he healed all that were sick. It was not that he might give his enemies a vindication of his divinity, but that he might fulfill the character presented of him in ancient prophecy. Had he not done so, he would not have been true to his own character. And if he did not still do so, he would not be Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever. These healings were not occasional, but continual, not exceptional, but universal. He never turned any away. He healed all that were sick. As many as touched him were made perfectly whole. He is still the same. Now this was the work of his life, and God would not have us forget that he spent more than three years in deeds of power and love before he went up to that cross to die. 
And we need the living Christ quite as much as Christ crucified. The Levitical types included the meal offering quite as much as the sin offering, and suffering human hearts need to feed upon the great loving heart of Galilee and Bethany as much as on the Lamb of Calvary. It would take entirely too long to examine in detail the countless records of his healing power and grace, or tell how he cursed the leper, the lame, the blind, the, the palsy, the impotent, and the fear-stricken, all that had need of healing, how he linked sickness so often with sin, and forgave before he spake the restoring word, how he required their own personal touch of appropriating faith, and bade them take the healing by rising up and carrying their bed. Now his healing went far beyond his own immediate presence, and reached and saved the centurion's servant, and the nobleman's son, and how often he reproved the last, the least question of his willingness to help, and through the responsibility of man's suffering on his own unbelief. These and many more such lessons crowd every page of the Master's life, and still reveal to us the secret of claiming his healing power, and what right any one can claim to explain away these miracles as mere types of spiritual healing and blessing and not as specimens of what he still is ready to do for all who trust him, is quite inexplicable. Such was Jesus of Nazareth. But was this blessed power to die with him? Number 8, John chapter 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Here is another, verily. Nay, a verily, verily, then it must be something emphatic, and something man was sure to doubt. Now, it is no use to tell us that this meant that the church after Pentecost was to have greater spiritual power and do greater spiritual works by the Holy Ghost than Jesus himself did, inasmuch as the conversion of the soul is a greater work than the healing of the body. Because Jesus says, The works that I do shall he do also, as well as the greater works than these. That is, he is to do the works, same works that Jesus did, and greater also. And so we know they did the same works that he did. Even during his life, he sent out the twelve apostles, and then he sent out the seventy as forerunners of the whole host of the Christian eldership, for the seventy were just the first elders of the Christian age, corresponding to the seventy elders of Moses, with full power to heal. And when he was about to leave the world, he left on record both these commissions in the most unmistakable terms. Number 9. Mark 16, verse 15 through 18. Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up servants. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Here is the commission given to them, the twofold gospel the assurance of his presence, and unchanging power. What right have we to preach the one without the other? What right have we to hold back any part from the perishing world? What right have we to go to the unbelieving world and demand their acceptancy of our message without these signs following? What right have we to explain their absence from our ministry by trying to eliminate them from God's word? or consign them to the obsolete past. Nay, Christ did give them, and they did follow, as long as Christians continue to believe and expect them. For it is important to observe the translation which Dr. Young gives of the 17th verse. Signs shall follow them that believe these things. The signs shall correspond to the extent of their faith. And by such mighty signs and wonders... 
the church was established in Jerusalem, Samaria, and unto the utmost parts of the earth. The unbelief of the world needs them today as much as the apostolic time. During the apostolic age, these manifestations of healing power were by no means confined to the apostles. Philip and Stephen were as gloriously used as Peter and John. In 1 Corinthians chapter 19, verse 9 through 30, quote, the gifts of healing, unquote, are spoken of as widely diffused and universally understood among the endowments of the church. But now the apostolic age is closing. Is this to be continued? And if so, by whom? By what limitation is it to be preserved from fantasism and presumption? By what commission is it to be continued to the end of time and placed within the reach of all God's suffering saints? We turn again with deep interest to number 10, James chapter 5, verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, let us notice first who gives this commission. It is James who had authority to say and summon up the decrees of the Council of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15 verse 19. My sentence is, the man who is named first by Paul himself among the pillars of the church. Galatians 2 verse 9. Again, observe to whom this power is committed. Now the apostles who are now passing away, not men and women of rare gifts and difficulty of access, but the elders, the men most likely to be within reach of every sufferer, the men who are to continue to the end of the age. Again, notice the time at which this commission is given, not at the beginning, but at the close of the apostolic age, nor for that generation, but for the one that was just rising, and all the succeeding ages. For indeed, these New Testament epistles, not widely circulated in their own age, but were merely designed for our admonishment upon whom the ends of the world are come. Again, observe the nature of the ordinancy enjoined, the prayer of faith, and the anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, this was manifestly not a medical anointing, for it was not to be applied by a physician, but by an elder, and must naturally be the same anointing of which we read Mark chapter 6, verse 13, and elsewhere in the connection of the healing of disease by the apostles themselves. For other interpretation would be strained and contrary to the obvious meaning of the custom as our Lord and his apostles observed it. In the absence of any explanation here to the contrary, we are bound to believe that it was the same, a symbolic religious ordinance expressive of the power of the Holy Ghost, whose particular em emblem is oil. The Greek church still retains the ordinance. The Romish apostasy has changed it into a mournful preparation for death. It is a beautiful symbol of the divine spirit of life, taking possession of the human body and breathing into it his vital energy. Again, observe that. This is a command. It ceases to be a mere privilege. It is the divine prescription for disease, and no obe obedient Christian can safely dispense with it. Any other method of dealing with sickness is unauthorized. This is God's plan. This makes faith so simple and easy. We have but to obey in childlike confidence. We will fulfill. And once more, we must not overlook the connection of sickness with sin. The suggestion that the trial has been a divine chastening and requires self-judgment, penitence, and pardon. And healing may be claimed together in his name. Number 11. 3 John, verse 2. Beloved, I wish, pray, above all things, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. 
if more were needed than the testimony of James, John, and the last of the apostles, and the one who best knew the Master's heart, has left this tender prayer, by which we may know our Father's gentle care for our health as well as for our souls. And when God breathes such a prayer for us, we need not fear to claim it for ourselves. But as we do, we must not forget that our health will be even as our soul prospereth. Number 12, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. These words recognize a union between our body and the risen body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which gives us the right to claim for our mortal frame the vital energy of his perfect life. He has given his life for us, and it is all sufficient. Number 13, Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. This cannot refer to the future resurrection. That will be by the voice of the Son of God, not the Holy Spirit. This is a present dwelling and a quickening by the Spirit, and it is a quickening of the mortal body, not the soul. What can this be but physical restoration, which is the direct work of the Holy Ghost, and which only they can receive who know the indwelling of the Divine Spirit? It was the Spirit of God that wrought all the miracles of Jesus Christ on earth. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. And if we have the same Spirit dwelling in us, we shall experience the same works. Number 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. This is Paul's physical experience, constant peril, infirmity, and physical suffering probably by persecution and even violence, in order that the healing, restoring, and sustaining power in the life of Jesus might be the more constantly manifest in his very body for the encouragement of suffering saints for your sakes. His life was a constant miracle that it might be to all men a pledge and monument of the promise made to him for all who might hereafter suffer. My grace is sufficient for thee. This life, he tells us, verse 16, was renewed day by day. The healing power of Christ is dependent on our continual abiding in him and like all his gifts is renewed day by day. Number 15. Finally, as a voice that has been speaking for 18 centuries, let us hear the sweet words. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this is but an echo of that voice that spoke these parting words a generation before. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He did not say, I will be. That would have suggested a break. But I am an unchanging now, a present never withdrawn, a love a nearness, a power to heal and save, as constant and as free as ever, even unto the end of the world. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thus have we traced the teachings of the Holy Scriptures from Exodus to Patmos. We have seen God giving his people the ordinance of healing in the very outset of their pilgrimage. We have seen it illustrated in the ancient dispensation in the sufferings of Job, the songs of David, and the sad death of Asa. We have seen Isaiah's prophetic vision of the coming healer. We have seen the Son of Man coming to fulfill that picture to the letter. We have heard him tell his weeping disciples of his unchanging presence with them. We have seen him 
transmit his healing power to their hands. And we have seen them hand it down to us and to the church of God until the latest ages of time. And now what more evidence can we ask? What else can we do but believe, rejoice, receive, and proclaim his great salvation to a sick and sinking world? End of chapter 1. Have been read by Dr. Peter Johnson.